something wicked this way comes. It's the feast day of Christ the King, and something or someone is holding back Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Something or someone is holding back the coming of the Lord. Who is that someone? Why is that? I want to talk about the catacomb, the restrainer, but not just of the Antichrist, that too, but of Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, because in fact, something wicked is coming, and I wonder if you're ready for it, because there will be suffering, and are we truly embracing the opportunity. Therein lies the question. I have before me this book. It is called, It is Paul Who Writes by Knox Cox. It's an old book published, I think, in the 50s. And uh, basically, it takes the translations of Monsignor Ronald Knox of St. Paul's Epistles and puts them next to the commentary of Father Ronald Cox. Father Ronald Cox was a theologian professor in uh, New Zealand, in Auckland, I believe. It's a very interesting book in my collection, and I want to read to you just a wee bit here from Thessalonians, from 2 Thessalonians. Now, what's interesting about this particular book is on one side is the translation of Monsignor Ronald Knox, and on the other side is the commentary of Father Ronald Cox. I don't think they're at all related, these two men. I just think he Father Cox liked the translation of Father Ronald Knox and wanted to use it. But on the left-hand side here is the uh, the actual translation of Monsignor Knox's Second Thessalonians. And it's about the coming of the Antichrist. It says this, the apostasy must come first, right? So let me back up one sentence. Do not let anyone find the means of leading you astray. There's a lot of talk of the end times. There's a lot of talk about what to expect. I'm going to be doing that in this video, as a matter of fact. Do not, St. Paul says, do not let anyone find the means of leading you astray. Don't be led astray. It goes on, the apostasy must come first. The apostasy, the rebellion, the revolution must come first. The champion of wickedness must appear first, destined to inherit perdition. This is the rebel who is to lift up his head above every divine name, above all that men hold in reverence, till at last he enthrones himself in God's temple. He must enthrone himself in God's temple and proclaims himself as God. That's the expectation. There's going to be an apostasy. The champion of wickedness, the Antichrist, will then be able to come onto the stage and he will enthrone himself in the temple and he will be worshipped as a god there. It goes on. Do not you remember my telling you of this before I left your company. At present, there is a power, you know what I mean, which holds him in check so that he may not show himself before the time appointed to him. I want you to let that sink in for a second. There is a power, St. Paul says in this translation, holding him in check until that time when it becomes appropriate for the great man of perdition, the champion of wickedness, the Antichrist himself to make his appearance known. Now, that was the translation of Monsignor Knox on this side. On this side is the commentary of Father Cox. Father Cox, quoting Monsignor Ronald Knox's commentary on this passage, says, Knox holds that the obstacle in the way of Christ's coming. Notice we are not talking about the holding back of the Antichrist. This is referring to the holding back of Jesus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Knox holds that the obstacle in the way of Christ's coming is the unbelief of the Jews. The unbelief of the Jews is restraining the coming of the Lord, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It goes on. In favor of this is Romans 11, 25 through 26, where Paul states that the Jews must be converted before Christ returns. So the, the champion of wickedness, the Antichrist, he's going to come and persecute the faithful. But our Lord can't come and bring uh, relief to the suffering of the faithful, to the wickedness in the world, until the Jews convert. The Jews are the catacon of Jesus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let that sink in. The Jews are the restrainer to the coming of the Lord. It goes on. It is a condition easily verifiable by Thessalonians. The Jewish persecution now raging there shows how far the Jews are from the conversion to the faith. 
The Jews were expected to know the time of their visitation. Our Lord says this repeatedly in the Gospels when he speaks to them. He expected it. They weren't given the day or the hour, but he expected that they could put the puzzle pieces together. He expected, as Luke 18 says, and as Matthew 25 makes clear, that you can read the signs of the times. You can tell me what the weather is based on what the sky looks like, but you can't put the puzzle pieces together on the signs of the times in the time of your visitation. You have rejected the true Messiah and you're still looking for a Messiah, therein lies the clue. So that's Ronald Knox's translation and opinion that the Jews are in fact the catacon or restrainer to the coming of the Lord. But I wanna pull out St. Jerome writing back in the 300s on the commentary of Daniel's prophecy. This is a fantastic resource. I highly recommend you get it because replete throughout his commentary is really a commentary on the Antichrist. Now, it's interesting because St. Jerome is pulling from even earlier saints and fathers and theologians in the church, like Hippolytus, for example, to, to come to some conclusions about what we believe about the time of the Antichrist. In fact, uh, from chapter 9 of Daniel's prophecy, the commentary says, Moreover, Hippolytus places the final week at the end of the world and divides it into the periods of Elias and the period of Antichrist, so that during the first three and a half years of the last week, the knowledge of God is established. And as for the statement, he shall establish a compact with, with many for a week, in Daniel 9.27, during the other three years under the Antichrist, the sacrifice and offering shall cease. But when Christ shall come and shall slay the wicked, one by the breath of his mouth, desolation shall hold sway till the end. Uh, and he talks about how uh, the Antichrist is going to rebuild the third temple on the platform there in Jerusalem and be accepted as a Messiah. I want you to let that sink in for a second. He says... Um, Jerusalem and the temple shall be rebuilt during three and a half years within the final week, be beginning with the advent of Elias. Are we seeing an effort to rebuild the temple right now in Jerusalem? Yes, you are. There is a lot of conversation going on right now about the effort of certain um, ultra-Orthodox Jews to reclaim the Temple Mount. In fact, the Al-Aqsa Flood of October the 7th, 2023, they called it the Al-Aqsa Flood because the Muslims were afraid the Jews were about to come and take the Temple Mount so they can rebuild their temple. There was talk of red heifers being sacrificed and everything. The The third temple conversation is, is going crazy. I got, I got a goat behind me. I don't know if you can hear that. Maybe that goat will become an offering in the temple. I don't know. Anyway, we move on. So he talks about this. He says, Then shall in ensure the final devastation and condemnation of the Jewish people who after their rejection of Christ's truth shall embrace the lie of the Antichrist. So this is the key to Jerome's commentary going back to the fourth century is that the Jews who have rejected the true Messiah who came to, to visit them and to bring them the good news, to fulfill all of the Old Testament covenant curses and blessings in himself and his passion, death, and resurrection, and to restore the dignity of the right of the firstborn, the order of Melchizedek and the priesthood, and the true offering and adoration of God, not in the offering of animals, of uh, bulls and goats and such like that, but his own. He was the true Lamb of God who was slain for the sins of the world, as John the Baptist tells us and John the Apostle makes clear to us. So they failed to recognize, they rejected him, and they even chanted, let his blood be upon us and upon our, ch our children. So they totally rejected Jesus, and they are now still hunting in their Pharisaicalism. They're still hunting for a Messiah, still looking for a Messiah. The Antichrist, the champion of the wickedness, is going to be the one who gives them what they're looking for, a fake and false Messiah. And as the fake and false Messiah is going to uh, mock God in every every opportunity, so you're going to see that the, that the Antichrist, in fact, comes from the Jews. Uh, he's going to have a fake and false uh, immaculate conception, a fake and false nativity, a fake and false, um, you know, set of miracles like walking on water, for instance, or healing people from their sickness or bringing people back from the dead or even levitation and, and rising up into heaven. So we're going to see the Antichrist pretend to be a Messiah. And as Jesus warned that they'll say, look, here he is and look, there he is. Do not go out to see them. Our Lord warned in the gospel. Going back to St. Jerome, he says, but those 
of our view with greater plausibility interpret all of this as applying to the Antichrist, for he is to be born of the Jewish people and come from Babylon. He is to be born of the Jewish people and come from Babylon. I want you to let that sink in. The Antichrist will come from the tribe of Dan, according to St. Jerome's commentary here. Um, according to St. Jerome's commentary, he will be of Jewish blood. This is why the Jews will accept him as Messiah. And he will leverage that acceptance, that wholesale buy-in of his lies and his misconceptions, and he will leverage that to convince them to worship him as a true God, just as they should have given adoration to Jesus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, when he visited upon them 2,000 years ago and they rejected him. They will give that same adoration to the Antichrist. And as a result, the Antichrist will then persecute the faithful. The Antichrist will persecute the faithful. Let that sink in. St. Jerome says here of chapter 11, Daniel's uh, prophecy, but in my opinion, this will all take place in the time of the Antichrist when the love of many shall wax cold. It is concerning these people that our Lord says in the gospel, dost thou think that the Son of Man, when he comes, will find faith upon the earth? So Ronald Knox's St. Paul's letter to the Second Thessalonians uh, translation here talked about a time, a time appointed when the Antichrist, the champion of wickedness, would come. It is being reserved, the, the catacomb, the restrainer holding back the Antichrist will be in place until that appointed time. What is the nature of that time? Luke 18, 8. When society, when the world waxes cold, they have no love, no charity for fellow man. They become callous and they lack faith. This is the time when the Antichrist will come and obviously will, will um, persecute the faithful. He even says here that there will be a, a small remnant that shall arise under the reign of Antichrist. And uh, this remnant will resist the Antichrist and they will be persecuted and many of them will fall. They will become martyrs. So this small remnant that rises up under the Antichrist, under the reign of Antichrist to resist him, I talked about that a few weeks ago with the prophecy of St. Hildegard. You should check out the link because it's fascinating. She gives us the vision of the five beasts and there's the fifth, the fifth beast, which is a gray wolf. And she talks about in that vision, a remnant who rises, who is prepared, a remnant of the faithful in a time of corruption within the leadership of the church, a corruption, a misleading of people, uh, a lying and a manipulative uh, leadership who lead people astray, a remnant rises to the occasion and they are ready and prepared to meet the Antichrist and to suffer well for them. But Jerome makes clear that the faithful are going to suffer in this time for the sake of the Jews, and there it's so important. He says, for the time their true salvation and help will be the coming of the Christ. For the Jews mistakenly imagine that he is the Messiah, the Antichrist, and is yet to come. For they are going to receive the Antichrist when he comes. So the Jews will be given an opportunity of many graces because of the suffering of the faithful under the reign of Antichrist. And the faithful will receive the opportunity to suffer well because the restrainer of the Antichrist is no longer restraining. The catacon is no longer restraining. Now, this is also very interesting. So to, 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 to bring this together, I looked at who was restraining the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords from Monsignor Ronald Knox, the Jews. The Jews are holding back the Lord, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords from coming, from bringing relief to the suffering of the faithful and to put an end to the wickedness in the world. So the Jews hold back the King of Kings. And because the Jews accept the Messiah, uh, the fake and false Messiah, the Antichrist, the champion of wickedness, the faithful suffer. And there can be no relief to that suffering until the Jews convert. The faithful will suffer so that the Jews can convert. Okay, so who, who restrains the Antichrist then? I covered this topic in my documentary film the end time, on the End Times. It's called The Secret of the Saints in the End Times. It's free. You can watch it right now. I'll link to it so you can just click play and enjoy. But I interviewed Joshua Charles, and one of the things he, he quotes, and this is, comes to us just about halfway through the film, and um, 
he quotes Henry Cardinal Manning, who believed that the Antichrist, the restrainer to the Antichrist, the catacomb, was in fact the papacy. The chair of St. Peter, the man who, who sits in that chair, holds the keys, the gatekeeper who restrains. And when the gatekeeper becomes, let's just say, I'm using my, 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 my words, not his, but when the gatekeeper loses his temporal power and becomes secular, no longer, no longer restraining, no longer holding back the world, the flesh, and the devil, well, then the Antichrist can come onto the stage and bad things happen from there. But here's the good news. No matter, no matter the, uh, whether or not the chair of St. Peter is restraining the Antichrist and the champion of wickedness, the man of perdition, the great apostasy that we see seemingly rolling out before us where so many faithful embrace heterodox ideas, so many bishops, um, you know, uh, are embracing heterodox ideas. We're seeing this in the headlines. It's not even hidden in the shadows anymore. We're seeing it all the time. Just the other day, there was a story here of MS-13 gang members kidnapping teenage girls and slaughtering them because a beast, a demon, told them that that's what they wanted uh, for a sacrifice. So the, the evil in the world is becoming very obvious to us. But here's the good news. And there is good news indeed. Today is the feast day of Christ the King. And the first, uh, the epistle today is, comes to us from St. Paul in the Colossians, Colossians 1, verses 12 through 20. The very first sentence, Brethren, giving thanks to God the Father, who hath made us worthy to be partakers of the lot of the saints in light. You get an opportunity to be on the team. Praise be to God. Friday, we talked about the feast day of St. Uh, um, the, the Henry V speech from from William Shakespeare, um, Crispin. Thank you, Crispin. Thank you, my guardian angel. Saint the feast day of Saint Crispin's day. We we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. We will remember this day that we got to fight, and we got to we got to be in this moment for the glory, for the glory. So it is kind of like our Saint Crispin's day. As we enter into a time of diabolical confusion, manipulation, and darkness, we can live in a state of grace, pursue virtue, and give honor and glory to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. No longer will it just be the, the stories of the saints from two millennia ago, right? St. Sylvester, or St. Cecilia, or St. Polycarp, or Bartholomew, and all of these fantastic, wonderful stories of saints who were martyred for the faith, their skin filleted from their bodies, or, or whatever, beheaded for the faith, like St. Paul. Now it's your turn. You get the opportunity to be, as St. Paul says, to give God glory, who hath made us worthy to be partakers of the lot of the saints in light. God's going to give you prevailing graces to embrace your cross. And if you embrace it joyfully, manfully even, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers who get to be in this wonderful time to live and to boast in the glory of God. What an opportunity we have. So let's not squander that. Let us be grateful that every day we have the breath in our lungs, no matter we have 10 days left or 10,000 days left. I don't know, it doesn't matter. Only God knows the timing of things. But however God decides, let us give glory to God and live zealously and faithfully and with fire in our bones that if it be God's glory, if it be God's will, that we should die as martyrs' deaths. Praise be to Jesus in all things, for long live Christ the King. Right? Viva Cristo Rey, for Christ truly is King, and his Antichrist can't even stop us, no matter what he does. And he'll try. Oh yes, he will try. But Christ is King, and his mother has already crushed his puny little skull, the devil. And his little peasant, the Antichrist, no matter what rage he unleashes upon us, cannot stop us. For as St. Paul says, if God is with us, who can be against us? Amen? Viva Cristo Rey.